Today's interview on the Overcoming Graduation podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash OCG. That's audibletrial.com slash OCG. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Overcoming Graduation with Brian Drury, a show where I work to teach you everything I wished I'd known about life to help you graduate to the next level on your own. Today, we have a phenomenal interview with an incredible human being by the name of Kevin Donahue. And when it comes to sales, there are few people in the world more qualified to speak on this topic than Kevin. At an early age, he was inspired by his grandfather's entrepreneurial pursuits to take on a life of generating wealth by creating massive value. He realized the connection to the more value he created, the more wealth he could generate. So by doing good in the world, good came back. And as a child, he started with paper routes and direct response marketing, and since then, he's never looked back. After achieving what most would consider to be massive success in the sales of construction equipment and technology, he found himself standing in his penthouse apartment looking out across Washington, D.C. In that moment, he had a realization. Something significant was missing from his life. There was so much more he wanted to do, and he wanted every moment to be infused with deep purpose and meaning. That pivotal moment in his life helped guide him to where he is now. Today, Kevin works as a sales consultant through his work with his company, Executive Sales Source, and is also deeply involved in cutting-edge human optimization research with his work with Neuro Performance Academy. Additionally, he runs a charity benefiting individuals in need in Panama, which combines two of his favorite things. It is aptly named Surf and Serve. In today's episode, Kevin will discuss why you should stop selling. Additionally, his definition of selling and how to use it to have people clamoring for your products and services. Why you should leave people haunted with indecision in a sales conversation. The definition of WIFM and why it is crucial to your business and life. Give up versus go up goals. How doctors are unlocking human potential using neuroplasticity and so much more. In the show notes, you can find links to learn more about Kevin and the incredible things he's doing. But now, without any further ado, please allow me to introduce you to Kevin Donahue. Kevin, how are you doing, man? Doing great. How's it going, Brian? It is a lot better now that me and you were talking. I've had a busy week, but I've been looking forward to this interview this whole week. So I'm excited to dive into your story. So for the listeners, I was uh, lucky enough to meet Kevin at Sean Stevenson's most recent 10K speaking event. And I got to hear him speak on stage and hear him share his story of what he's gone through and the different things that he's experienced in his life that have brought him to a really incredible place running multiple businesses, but really driven by purpose and delivering value to humanity. So when I heard his story, I really wanted to bring him on and we're going to dive in. You're going to hear all about it. So Kevin, you told me that in undergrad, you went to uh, Radford University and can you tell the listeners a bit about what you chose to study and what were you feeling about the real world when you were about to graduate? Yeah, great. First of all, thanks for having me on. Thanks for the very kind introduction. It's, uh, I'm excited to make an impact with you and your listeners here today. Uh, it, it's, it's a great question because I was young. I was 17 years old when I graduated uh, high school and I went off to Radford University. And Radford's in Southwest Virginia, uh, down near Virginia Tech. And it's a liberal arts school. And the reason I chose to go there was because they had a criminal justice program. And so so your listeners know where I'm from. I'm from the Washington, D.C. area, so Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father was a, worked for the federal government for 38 years. My neighbors worked for federal agencies like the USDA, the FBI, the Secret Service. So I grew up in a neighborhood full of, uh, you know, white-collar, middle-class uh, federal workers. So, you know, growing up, that's what I thought you did. You know, my dad had a nice living. We lived in a nice neighborhood. My mom was a stay-at-home mom until... Uh, you know, my little sisters were in uh, elementary school, and then she went off and worked in the school system and became a school administrator at some point. But really, the framework I had was you went to college to go get a good government job. <laughs> so for me, I've always been a bit of an entrepreneur. You know, by the time I was 12 or 13 years old, I had a monopoly on all the paper routes in the neighborhood. <laughs> Listen, Washington Post in the morning, I think I delivered 100 plus papers, and then Potomac News in the afternoon. 
by the time I was 14 and a half, I was doing telemarketing. This, this guy, uh, if you hike through the woods uh, to another neighborhood, this guy had a telemarketing business he was running uh, in the basement of his home. Mm-hmm. And so at 14 and a half, I learned how to do telemarketing. I was getting paid $4 an hour. So needless to say, I was one of the richer kids in the neighborhood. You know, I was able to buy new skateboards and do things that most people weren't able to do. But I didn't know what business was. All I knew was I had to go get a job. Or I didn't, really didn't know what entrepreneurism was. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I said, if I have to get a government job, I might as well do something cool. You know, so watching television shows, uh, you know, about police and, you know, maybe Miami Vice or these, these shows that were on when I was a kid, uh, you know, they looked somewhat exciting. And, you know, having FBI agent, uh, friends of the family, I was like, that seems cool. I could investigate. It didn't seem like a boring government desk job. So I said, okay, I'll go off to college and get a degree in criminal justice. And that's what I did. I spent four years uh, studying criminal justice, law enforcement, criminology, sociology, psychology, really uh, cool stuff. Uh, and uh, that's what I got my degree in. So that was the plan initially was to go off to college uh, and get my degree in criminal justice, maybe come out and be a cop for a few years while I applied for different federal law enforcement agencies, maybe U.S. Marshals, DEA, something like that. And so, uh, you you know, you know my story now. So uh, things kind of didn't quite work out that way. But that's what I originally went to college for, to get a degree in criminal justice. And that original entrepreneurial streak, was that driven by your family? Was that driven by maybe some TV or some experiences that you had as a kid? Or was it just in you ever since you were little? It's a great question, Brian. Uh, It's very interesting because I was just a little bit strange. (laughs) I used to call myself weirdo with a capital W because I just thought different and I wanted to do things different. I remember when I was three or four years old, there was two playgrounds, one we could walk to up the street, and there was one a couple miles away, and it had one of those like, little merry-go-round things you can spin on. And the, the one we, at, at near our house just had monkey bars and a swing set. And I'd always tell my dad, Dad, can we please go to the, the other playground? Let's, you know, could you drive us over there? And he'd always say, we'll see. You know, and as a kid, that, that means no, right? Right, go, of course. Th- dad wants to lay there and you know, take a nap or watch the game. Or he doesn't want to go, with the, go to the other one right up the street. And I came up with this phrase. I said, at four years old now, not we'll see, we'll do. (laughs) So I was like (laughs) insistent on having some sort of bigger or better life. Um, You know, and I remember back before the internet, you know, we used to have magazines. Like I was a little skate rat. Mm -hmm. We had these skateboard magazines like Thrasher Magazine and and Trans World. And I would, in the back, there would be advertisements for all the different skate companies and like Vans back then were kind of tough to come by. They didn't sell Vans in, in stores. You had to special order them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the skateboard companies, you know, trucks and wheels. And, and so I, I started writing these companies and asking them for free stickers and they <laughs> respond. So I was doing direct response marketing when I was about 10, 11, 12 years old. And I really got good at it. I got some companies that were sending me hundreds of stickers to di- distribute to my friends. So to answer your question, it was, I think it was inside of me. I always wanted to do more, be more and have more. I always had a bigger uh, vision than most people. So, uh, so even getting a degree in criminal justice, going to college, I said, okay, I want to be the chief of police or I want to be the head of the FBI. So I, I kind of thought a little bit differently. So, so no, the entrepreneurism didn't come from uh, anyone in my direct family. Although when I look back, my grandfather father on my mother's side, he was a, a World War II hero, a veteran. And uh, he was in the 463rd Anti-Aircraft Artillery Battalion. He used to shoot down Nazi planes. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a fascinating guy. And what was different about him than my father is my papa, is what we called him, uh, never really had a job. But he had businesses. I mean, he was a beekeeper, so he had made honey. He was a a carpenter, so he built homes. And and, and, he he did all kinds. He fixed cars and tractors, and and he raised Christmas trees. So I think... A little bit of that rubbed off on me. I'm like, why does my dad put on a suit and tie and go to work every day? And Papa doesn't seem to do that. And so I think maybe I picked up a little bit of his energy or or saw that something uh, more was possible. Yeah, that osmosis through your experiences, observing him doing that started to bleed into you. So you didn't just see that, all right, a job and a future and a career means you get up and you do the nine to five and you're wearing a suit. You saw someone that was a different example. And part of the reason I'm so excited to have you on the show is you're now one of those examples for people like me and for my listeners, because I saw what you've done and I'm excited for us to dive more into the story. 
but you exist as a person that allows me and helps me to challenge the realities around me because I see what you've done. I see the way you've incorporated service into your life. I see the way that you've run multiple businesses. And even before this, I was talking to my brother about like, dude, I'm doing way too much. I'm not getting enough results moving forward. So it's having conversations with people like you that helps to inspire and remind me that it's possible but also the more examples that you introduce yourself to, and that's a big part of this show, is for me to share, um, share the messages of people like you with the listeners so they can see that there are other opportunities and other ways to do things out there. Yeah, it's great. It, you're only, uh, your growth is as limited as your possibilities or the mm-hmm. choices that you have. So really learning about what people do, knowing that there's other opportunities and possibilities. You know, a hundred years ago, if you grew up in the, the coal mining town of West Virginia, you know, you became a coal miner. That right. was the choice. You know, now with an iPhone, you're an international businessman. Like mm-hmm. right away, right off the bat, you know, you can start a business from your iPhone and you're selling in, in different parts of the world. So it's, it's really changed quite a bit, but it's really good to hear real life stories and real life examples, the successes and the failures, because we all have them, to really understand what's possible and what's uh, available to you in the future. Right. And so to continue in your story, so you came up on graduation, you had the plans, I'm going to be police chief, I'm going to go for a big government job. And can you tell the listeners about what happened next? Yeah, great. Uh, so, you know, I get out of college and I immediately had a opportunity working for a large equipment rental company. It was actually Hertz Equipment Rental. And it was a fraternity brother from college who was already working there. I didn't have any income and I always loved earning money. You know, I mentioned earlier, <laughs> 13 or 14, I, I, you know, I was the richest kid in the neighborhood. I liked having a job. I liked working. I was a lifeguard over summertime and I had a bunch of different uh, things that I did. But as I graduated, I said, okay, well now it's time to get to, you know, put on my big boy pants and get a job. And so I, I uh, applied for this job. I got hired right away and it was renting and selling heavy construction equipment, rental, uh, heavy construction equipment. And it, you know, put money in my pocket. But as I was doing that, I was applying for all these different police jobs, Virginia State Police, uh, Montgomery County, U.S. Marshals. And, you know, these are long, arduous processes. You have to go through 10 years of your background. You have to take polygraph examinations. You've got to do the physical examination. So it's not just a cakewalk. It takes, you know, six months to a year sometimes to get hired. So in the meantime, I got into the business world and it just happened to be in the heavy construction equipment. And so I was working that job and I was on the counter on the inside sales coordinator for about six to eight months and they promoted me to outside sales. And at that point, they gave me the truth. I'm 22 years old, I think, maybe 21, 22. They gave me keys to a brand new Ford F-150. They gave me a territory in Northern Virginia and they said, good luck. Go make a living, right? (laughs) And I said, wow, all of a sudden I was free and I was out in the world. And, And then I remember clearly I uh, sold a John Deere 644 wheel loader to, to a golf company. They were building a golf course there in Northern Virginia. And so uh, I sold this, this piece of equipment for about $64,000. And I remember it was just a few conversations and the company cut the check and I got a $4,000 commission. Mm -hmm. And so right then and there, I said, holy cow, you're telling me all I have to do is go out and have conversations with people and I can get paid four or five grand. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I'm applying for police positions at the time. I think we're paying thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars a year, right? So a big light bulb, an aha moment came came on that really kind of changed my trajectory. I'm like, wait a minute, am I going to go risk my life arresting people and putting myself in really bad situations? But, you know, uh, maybe arresting people for stuff I don't even care about, writing t- traffic tickets. I'm like, I just started rethinking. I said, is that really what I want to do? Spend my life doing? And I said, no, I said, I think there's something bigger here. And so I, I kept that job. I got recruited away and uh, to another construction equipment company. Um, and I did that for like three or four years. And it was good. It was good money, but it really wasn't what I wanted to do longer term. You know, I got kind of tired of, you know, being knee deep in mud on construction sites and working with construction workers. And you're, in the equipment business, you're sort of the low man on the totem pole. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're getting yelled at by everyone else. And so I said, I'd like to work with CEOs. You know, I want to, I do want to put on a suit and tie and I want to go work in a more corporate setting. And so then I uh, applied for a job with a software company. This is back in the late nineties and I got hired and, uh, and it changed everything because now instead of selling equipment or renting equipment, now we were doing these deals that were millions of dollars oftentimes, sometimes tens and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars selling enterprise software. 
And so now as I was selling at an executive level and it, and it changed everything. And then the paychecks just got, you know, kind of bigger from there, which was, which was really nice. And at that point I had just sort of turned my back on working for the government or working in law enforcement. And what's interesting is a lot of my good friends now to this day are secret service agents. And my roommate uh, way back when was a secret service agent who has been on the presidential protective detail for Obama and Bush and a number of other uh, dignitaries. And he would bring home applications. He was like, Hey man, why don't you apply? We'll get you right in. You know, (laughs) it was 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 sort of temptation to go back to what I knew and use my degree. But I said, man, I think it just would be, uh, it wouldn't be worth it for me. I think I like doing what I'm doing, being in sales, even working for a corporation gave me uh, the opportunity to, to grow my wealth and also have some freedom and the opportunity to, to work with executives at a different level. And it's a really interesting point because I know I've experienced this and I know people experience this all the time where they get so hung up on the plan that they fail to see the better opportunity sitting in front of them or they won't give themselves permission to allow themselves to see that there's this better thing that fits me better, that gives me more freedom, that gives me more ability to live the type of life I want. But no, I said I was going to be in law enforcement. So I guess I've got to do that. One of those big lessons is that it's our life. We can choose at any moment to shift gears. We can choose at any point. Like you said, it wasn't like that door was shut. You had people coming and dropping applications off just saying, hey, Kevin, if you want to come back, bro. But you saw something greater and you saw a bigger potential. And before we continue with your story, I'd love to get maybe some two or three tips on how to effectively sell. I know we could do a lot more and you have a lot of experience with this, but what are two or three of the most important aspects of effectively selling so that you're not the used car salesman that's just trying to you know, make their money and doesn't matter what happens to the other person, but you're also able to connect and build the trust so the person knows that this sale is going to benefit them, you know it's going to benefit you, and they're happy to make that transaction. Well, I'd first say stop selling, mm. right? I mean, it's like even we say selling and we instantly go to the used car salesman and somehow it, it gets attributed to con artistry or something like that. And so what I say is stop selling and start advising people. You know, whatever you're great at, if you just tell people the truth about, hey, here's what you can do. I mean, in my experience, here's what, uh, what you can get. So, and let me also define, uh, let me give you my definition of selling. So for me, It's painting a picture of a future that's bigger than when I showed up for the person or people that I'm working with, that I'm either meeting with or on the phone with. So what happens is I'm speaking possibility, a new future that didn't exist prior to me being there. And then all I have to do, if I do that effectively, is invite them into that bigger future with me. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I started telling a story, hey, listen, because I was at the – the Emmys uh, earlier this week. And I said, Hey, Brian, listen, I got front row tickets to the Emmys. You'll be sitting next between the rock and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you want them or not. They're going to, they're kind of expensive, but they're there for you. If you want them, <laughs> a, like you're going to sit next to them between rock and Oprah. Is that a cool future for you? You're Hell like, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty extraordinary future. And I say, if you want them, just give me a call. Like mm-hmm. now I'm not selling you anything. Although there is a sale to be made. It's just a matter of you saying, holy cow, if you get off the phone with me, you're going to call your best friend or maybe your parents or someone you know. You're going to say, you're not going to believe this. I just got invited to the Emmys and I get to sit between Rock and Oprah Winfrey, two amazing American icons. Uh, you know, and it's going to cost me a couple thousand bucks or a thousand bucks or 500 bucks or 15, whatever it costs. Man, I've got to figure this out. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, so what I say is if your invitation is powerful enough, if you do this effectively, you will leave the person haunted with their own indecision (laughs) because you know the only thing between you and having that bigger future is you, Mm. is your ability to get at the cash, right? And I I use the example of uh, real estate agents, residential real estate agents. You know, uh, they'll go sell someone on a home in the school district and the neighborhood. And listen, they don't even have, they're not even married yet. You know, they don't have any kids. Why are you selling them in the school district? Because they're painting a picture 10, 20, 30 years out. So that person goes and puts themselves in 30 years of debt. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Who pays? They don't have the cash. My point is when you do, when you sell powerfully, when you advise powerfully, people will find the money because Mm -hmm. the other tip I would give is make sure you're speaking into their context or their listening. 
you know, I use the example, I think you've heard me use this, uh, you know, are you selling a, a Honda or a Ferrari? You know, there's a context around Ferrari. A Ferrari, every, when I say that, 90% of the population sees what color, Brian? Red. Yeah, it's always red. The Honda mm -hmm. is gray, black, or blue. Yep. You know, and so why is that? Well, there's a context for a Ferrari. The Ferrari is $350,000. The Honda is $35,000. One's an aspirational thing you're selling. The other is just a utility, right? Meanwhile, a Honda and Ferrari will both get you from point A to point B. They burn gasoline, have four wheels, and a steering wheel. It, one's 10 times as much. Why is that? Because the conversation you're having about it is much bigger. And this is one of the things I do in my consulting business is I consult businesses on how to add a zero, sometimes two zero to the price of what they're selling by changing the context. So really I don't sell. I go out there and I advise and I, uh, and I become the authority in what I do. And then I just invite people to participate with me or not. I don't care. I still have the tickets to the Emmys sitting between The Rock and Oprah. It's either you're going to buy them or someone else is going to buy them. I don't need your money. I have the goods, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing I would encourage people is when you're in business, find something that you know is the best in the world or create something that you know is the best in the world. Then you're not selling. You're just bragging about it. And when you <laughs> brag about it elegantly, you actually become somewhat evangelical. It's like I, would, I tell people, like, Brian, if you had – the cure for breast cancer. Would you just sit back and be like, oh man, I got to go sell this. I got to go be a used car salesman. Hell no. You'd be no. amped out of your mind. You'd you would be, like, be. Look what I've got. I've got the most incredible thing to show you and it's going to help so many people and yeah. I just need to get the word out. That's where the energy would be. And so you would, do, you would do everything you could to get the word out. You would scream from the mountaintops. You would talk to every single hospital. You would put it on social media. You would market your brains out. Not even necessarily for the money, although the money will follow. Mm -hmm. It's because the extraordinary value that you get to share with people. And so that's the thing. It's like, and so that's why, you know, that used car says the thing. I throw that out the window because I don't deal in used cars. I deal in Ferraris. Mm -hmm. And when I'm passionate about Ferrari, like I don't, I don't have to go even like if so, if you go into a Ferrari dealership and you ask for a discount, do you know what they tell you? <laughs> You're in the wrong dealership. Yeah. They say Kia's <laughs> down the road, Brian. <laughs> they got a big gorilla out front for their Labor Day sale, big blow up gorilla. You know, it's like, <laughs> You know, we don't do that here. There's a wait list, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like having integrity, telling the truth, and creating a powerful context that actually becomes the invitation for people to participate in, you know? And so what we have to look at is what, it, what is it in our lives that we're passionate about? What is it that we're, we go bonkers over that we're excited about? Why is that? What's the context that's created that's luring me into that? And then it's like, okay, what kind of products do I have to represent or create and then what's the conversation that creates that same sort of energy? It's like Jordan's, you know, Air, Jordan's shoes, you mm -hmm. know, four or 500 bucks. People wait in lines for, for hours for the new Jordans. I'm like, this is crazy, but people are passionate about it. And all Nike's doing is saying, hey, and come in and, uh, and, and enjoy our product, right? And it's just like, right. it's, so it's, it's very, very, uh, very powerful. So that's when it comes to selling. And especially when you're selling at an executive level to CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, whatever it may be. You really have to understand what's the context that they're willing to, uh, you know, part with their budget money in order to get into your solution. You know, I, and I think you know this, some of my clients, I've worked with the White House, mm -hmm. Homeland Security, CIA, World Bank, uh, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, some really big companies all over the world. And, uh, you know, how do you go into the White House, for example, and tell a story that's so powerful that they trust you not only with their budget money, but also with their most sensitive information. In this case, it was classified, declassified emails. Right. That's not selling. That's advising. Right. And so that's what I would say on, on that. It's a whole, I take a different approach. I don't know anyone else out there that takes this kind of approach when it comes to selling. It's being evangelical, really knowing what you have, knowing the value and uh, making sure people get it and leaving people haunted with that invitation to attend the Grammys next to their famous superstar heroes. And for all the listeners, I really want to reemphasize that because Kevin, that's one of my, that might be my new favorite definition of selling because one thing that kept coming up for me as you were going through that description was the absolute confidence you have in the value of that product. And for anyone who's having doubts about selling, I challenge you to think, 
Is it because you're afraid to sell or is it because you're afraid that your product isn't that great and what do you need to do to level it up? What do you need to do to change the story? How do you need to change your market? Who do you need to focus on? So all of those components come together and Kevin, I loved what you said about it's just a conversation. It's I've got the most incredible, it's like having an iPod when everyone still had a disc man. It's like, yeah, you just uh, spin this little wheel and you've got thousands of songs in the palm of your hand. People are going to be clamoring for that. So it's, it's a better solution. Mm, and when yes. it's, and when it's that compelling, you see, there's, there's, there's a couple, there's a distinction here. It's very important. What I told you was very compelling. Would you agree? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a compelling invitation for you to deal with. I don't have to convince you of anything. What most people out there think is they have to go out there and convince people. You mm -hmm. see, compelling is having a conversation that's really about their reasons, right? Right. Uh, it, it, and so I'm selling you a solution. Hey, man, you can go from like, you know, a Walkman with a, with a tape cassette or a CD, or you can go to this thing with, a, with you have a thousand uh, uh, songs in your pocket. What? That's compelling right? I don't have to convince you, hey, well, listen, these buttons over here and this does that. It doesn't matter. I got a thousand, phone, thousand songs in my pocket. So when you convince, it's my reasons. Hey, Brian, here's, listen, I need you to come over here and do this and do that because, because this, and, and people, they, there's a thing in sales, it's called with them. It's what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. So it's W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me. That's the context with which human beings listen from. People mm -hmm. listen, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? I, did you see yourself sitting between The Rock and Oprah Winfrey? Immediately. As yeah, soon immediately. As you, you saw what was in it for you. You're like, holy yeah. shit, I can get, I can get uh, photos next to these people. I can meet them, maybe do business with them. Oh my gosh, I'll be famous. Like you saw your future just by me painting that story. Mm -hmm. So painting a picture of that more powerful future and then just having an invitation around it is so, so powerful. And so that's, uh, it's, and, and what happens too is, there's a, uh, so when you're convincing, it's sort of you over there and me over here. Mm. And I'm trying to convince you to co come over where I am. When it's compelling, we are naturally side by side looking at a bigger future together, right? That's what happens when it's compelling, when it's a solution for them. All of a sudden it's like, hey, Kevin, do you really have those tickets to the, to the Emmys? You know, and the answer is if you do want them, I could get them for you. I mean, I really could, right? I don't know who will be sitting there, but I could get you those tickets. So it's like, but now you're sitting side by side and we're figuring out, hey, how can we make this happen? Versus right. trying to convince you to come over here and buy for my reasons. Well, I'm sold on your definition of selling for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, and the funny thing is, even in those hypothetical examples you gave of being at the Emmy, sitting between The Rock and Oprah or finding the cure for, I, I got excited. I was like, imagine being able to share that with people and I'm already, my brain is turning about like, what could I do with my products to tell that story, to, sh to connect them with that greater future? So you're and here, one more thing. Oh, I, one more thing I would like to say is it's a, it's a state of being. Mm. It's not a doing. It's like, who are you being in that moment while you're compelling someone to do business with you? It's not like, what do I have to do? People have a checklist. Okay, first I have to do this and I have to do that. And it's creepy when you just yeah. walk in and you're being a certain way, you're being a kind of person who's a servant. You're being the kind of person that helps people naturally. You're being the kind of per person that wants to have a long-term partnership. You know, the deal I did with the white house was during the Bush administration. I redid a deal with the Obama administration. I just found out uh, two months ago that the, the Trump administration re-upped. This is mm -hmm. going to be an 18 year deal that I did, Brian. That's nice. long-term future based thinking. Right. And so it's like playing the long game versus the short game. And that is simply a way of being. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. It's coming at it, knowing it's service. And the other piece that I love that you said was you don't need it, that you're not out operating from a place of desperation or manipulation because you know what you have is so good that if this person doesn't pick it up, the next person will. So, hey, yeah. if you want to come on this ride, let's go. So let's yeah. jump back to your story and talk about how you continued on your ride. Sure. So you were in the uh, software sales. Things are going great. And then you had a big inflection point come in your life. So can you share with the audience what that looked like? Yeah, I certainly did. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize because of the specific specificity of your audience is that if you look at your life, your 20s, I, I tell this to everyone, especially for men, but for women as well, your 20s are your opportunity to figure out what you like and what you don't like. 
So you have to try things out. You know, sometimes, oh, you think getting this big job, working for a corporation is going to be great. Then you're there like, man, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. So you use your 20s and maybe even your early 30s to sort of experiment. Like, what's out there? Mm -hmm. It's real, And your 20s are tough because you don't know what you don't like and you don't really know what you like. And you've gone from being the big man on campus in high school and college to not knowing anything. And you're the low man on the totem pole. So your 20s are really an opportunity. And it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's a great time to really kind of figure out and fine tune what you're good at, and what you're not good at, because that's just as important. And so what I did in my 20s was a lot of the stuff we spoke about. And in my 30s, I uh, switched companies. I began working for a uh, forensic investigative search engine company out of Holland. And I had a great time. And that's when I was doing all the business with the, the different federal law. I, so here's where my degree came back. Right. I actually mm -hmm. ended up working with investigators. So my clients were the FBI, Secret Service, SEC, Homeland Security, a lot of the inspector generals. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, but, you know, after doing all this work and finding success, my entrepreneurial, uh, you know, bug got me and I launched an internet marketing business. I had a famous dog for a while. <laughs> Yogi the Pug was, if you, if you Google him, you'll laugh. He was a, a, a pug that I adopted and he had a broken tongue that hung out of his mouth, mouth all the time. He was one of the first viral YouTube videos back in 2006. Hmm. Ended up on the Rachel Ray show and I had manufactured dolls and greeting cards and calendars and t-shirts and I had a whole array of products over this dog. Uh, and the whole theme was when life breaks your tongue, keep on licking, right? It was a <laughs> real trip. It was, I mean, I used to get emails from around the world. My website went from getting about four or 500 hits a day to well over 30, 40,000 after the Rachel Ray show. But anyway, I also opened a spa and tanning salon out in McLean, Virginia. And, uh, that was a great opportunity for me to get out in the entrepreneurial world and the business, take a big risk, had a, you know, a loan of several hundred thousand dollars. I also invested in some property. So what happened, Brian, the story that you alluded to was, uh, you know, there I was in my top floor condominium that overlooked Washington, D.C., you know, view of the National Cathedral and Georgetown, and really beautiful uh, sort of penthouse corner condominium. And, uh, and, I, was, uh, and I was bored. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there I was. My clients were the White House and all these folks I just mentioned. And uh, I was bored. I was just kind of fed up. I was like, this isn't really what I want to do. And this is like probably 33, 34 years old. Uh, yeah, right around that age, 32, 33, 34. And I said, man, this isn't really what I want to do. And, and I had this feeling, I'm like, man, life just isn't worth living. And, and I wasn't suicidal. I want to be clear about that. But I just like, man, this is, this is life. This, is, this sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, everything seemed like, you know, but meanwhile, I was successful. Uh, and I was also uh, almost $2 million in debt from business debt and real estate debt. And I said, something's not right with this picture. I was like, there's got to be more to life than this. And so I, in, instead of being more depressed and slipping into depression, I wrote down, I said, okay, if I had a magic wand, what would be the five things I would do uh, with my life? With nothing was in the way. I just, you know, suspended all disbelief. What would I do? And so I wrote down five things. The one was to surf. I said, yeah, I'd like to surf every day. That'd be cool. Just get up, get my surfboard, go surfing. I said, I'd like to uh, get closer to my faith. I was raised Catholic, but I really wanted to understand why I'd been around for 2,000 years. Why did this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, change the world? Who was he? Uh, I wanted to learn to speak Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to do service work. And then I wanted to immigrate to a foreign country. And the reason for that was a lot of Bolivians and El Salvadorians and Ethiopians and Koreans uh, in Washington, D.C. area came to uh, the U.S. with nothing. And we can see that all over the country. Uh, they come with nothing and they end up being millionaires or they thrive. You know, I, I was just having a conversation this two days ago with a guy who came from Vietnam back in 1975 and he escaped communist ruling uh, Vietnam, came here with nothing. Now he's a millionaire. You know, he's just very successful and it's, and it's fascinating to me. I said, what if I did that? What if I gave up everything I owned and moved to a foreign country where I didn't know the culture, the language or anything, the people? I said, man, am I willing to blow everything up that I got, you know? And then those five things led to one thing for me because I said, okay, what, what's one thing I could do where I could accomplish all five of these? Hmm. And I just thought of Costa Rica. I'd been there visiting and I, I'd seen, I'd love the people. I, they speak Spanish. I surf there. Uh, you know, I can get involved with uh, an organization to do some sort of uh, relief for some uh, impoverished people. Uh, and then I could just, you know, get involved with the church down there. And so what I did, Brian, was... Uh, that map of Costa Rica, I put it up on my uh, bathroom mirror. 
found a map of Costa Rica, put up my bathroom mirror so I had to see it every day. So I became singularly focused on one outcome because I knew that outcome would help me accomplish the other five. Mm-hmm. And I think it might have been eight months later. I don't know the exact time frame, uh, but I was uh, on my way to Costa Rica. I had closed down the, the spa and tanning salon. I had sold some of my properties. I had closed some big deals that put money in my pocket, and I was on my way to Costa Rica. And, uh, and I moved there, and I lived there for, for two years, and it was, uh, changed my life forever. What I love about this is how you took the step of saying, what could I create? And if I could create that reality, what would be perfect for me? You took out all the barriers, all the excuses, and then you looked for the keystone. Like, it's, like, like I've heard of keystone habits. You change this one habit and all the other bad habits fall off and the good ones come in. In this way, it was what was the keystone action that would enable you to do all of those different things. Now, I know when people are on the precipice of making a massive life-altering change, that's often when the greatest resistance, the greatest negative voices, you know, that voice in your head going, oh, well, you can't really do that. And you don't, you've never surfed and how could you do And you're not, you've never been good at language and all these voices pop up. What did you do to overcome the negative voices? Because I know this is something I deal with constantly and this is something that all of the listeners face as well. So what recommendations would you have for people who know there's something so much greater out there for them but the resistance is holding them back right now. They can't, seem to get, they can't seem to get the better of it. You have to be committed to your outcome uh, because it's not just the voices in your head. It's the voices in your life. There wasn't a single person in my – there was one person in my life who said it was a good idea. 99.9% of the people said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? It's a bad time to go. The economy, uh, this and that. You've got it made. You know, everyone would convince me not to do what I was going to do. So what I did was I kept my passion and my purpose secret from most people. (laughs) You know, it was me and that map of Costa Rica. You have to be singularly focused and you have to have a very strong why. And let me explain to you what happened when I really got clear that Costa Rica was my absolute. There's nothing going to get in the way of me and living in Costa Rica. Uh, And you also have to have mentors. And sometimes there are mentors in real life who encourage you. Other, and sometimes you have to hire them other times uh, or take them to lunch or something. Uh, other times it's people, uh, autobiographies. I mean, read the autobiography of, of Teddy Roosevelt or of Martin Luther King Jr. Or, or, or Gandhi or any of these people who did something big or read the story about Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, it's like, what am I going to do? How can, if, if I can change my world, I can change the world. So I got singularly focused and here's what I did. I was so committed, and I'm not sure if you know this or not. Maybe I mentioned it uh, when I saw you last. Uh, you know, I went homeless for three or four months. I did not four, know that. It was four months. But what I mean was I purposely went homeless. I wasn't living on the street destitute. I mean, I'm a guy wearing a, a, a suit presenting at the White House, National Security Council, right? Like, I had my spa and tanning salon, and I said, okay, what if, how can I get out of debt? And uh, it's uh, Thomas Jefferson's... Uh, yeah, uh, not Thomas Jefferson, uh, Benjamin Franklin, says there's two ways to get wealthy. One is to spend less, the other is to earn more. And the fastest is to do both. Hmm. So I got really, really committed to spending zero money. And I said, okay, well, where am I spending money now? How can I stop it? So I cut off television, cable. I said, man, I have all this money leaking out of my life that I don't even need. So I got down to the bare bones. And then I said, how could I convert whatever I have in my life to an asset that puts money in my pocket? So I said, well, I got this condo I'm living in. It's a beautiful condo. There's, you know, it's a high-end rent neighborhood. I said, what if I just rented my place furnished? Hmm. At the time, I think I got 2,500 bucks a month, you know, four months. That's 10 grand mm-hmm. in my pocket. And that's 10 grand. And that's 25 bucks or whatever much I wasn't spending out. And so I lived in room one of my spa and tanning salon. So every night I'd go there. After the spa was closed and I'd have an inflatable mattress, my employees never knew this. <laughs> uh, and I'd, you know, I'd sleep there. I'd get up at 6 a.m. I'd go to the gym. I'd work out, shower, and then go to my appointments and do what I had to do. And that level of commitment, I said, I'm going to do this no matter what. I'll make myself homeless was what, is what, what really drove me. And whenever someone doubted me, I said, I can't hear it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Nothing's going to stop me. And then... I got in a car eight months later, driving across the country, going to drive down to Costa Rica. So you drive through Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, then you're in Costa Rica. 
And I put myself on a month, one month journey. Halfway across the country, I hear that there's a military coup in Honduras. And the president, Zuleha at the time, was held up in the Brazilian embassy. So I called some friends in the State Department. They said, we don't know what's going on. I said, oh, man. So that was an obstacle. I said, well, what if I drive all the way there and I can't get through Honduras, which you have to go through? So all I did was park my car at my friend's house in Austin, Texas, and I flew to Costa Rica. I knew my, <laughs> I knew my outcome. The, the, the driving there was part of the adventure, but I said, okay, well, the more important thing was me getting to Costa Rica so I could learn to speak Spanish, surf every day, get closer to my faith, uh, and immigrate to a foreign country and, uh, and learn Spanish mm -hmm. and do service work. And so, uh, and so you, know, you have to be ultra committed. I mean, you have to be, there's a, there's a great phrase out there. It's about the Vikings taking a, a, an island or a town. It's they burn the boats behind them. Mm -hmm. There's no other alternative. And so even if someone says, hey, uh, you know, you can't do that. Well, I have to. And the reason the Viking warriors would burn the boats behind them is they either take the city or they die trying. Right. Right. And so I was going to be in Costa Rica. I was going to learn to speak Spanish no matter what. I was going to do this stuff no matter what. I get there. I get involved with Christian surfers. I get involved with a non-denominational church down there. I'm in a Bible study every Tuesday morning where we surf before or after. I do this mission work down in Nicaragua now and also in Costa Rica and other places. Uh, hablo Espanol, ahorita, and, you know, as you know. And so it's, it's just a, it's an, it's a fascinating thing when we're willing to give up what's not excellent in our life to pursue the things that are. Mm -hmm. And I found it really interesting when you spoke about this that you weren't telling everyone because I've heard more often people say, tell everybody, put it out there, make it known to the world. And like, then you have nothing to fall back on. The more you make it known, the better. But hearing your perspective, I was like, for some people, that's not the right way because those negative voices, the family coming in and saying, listen, that's crazy, that can wear you down. So sometimes the best thing is to play it close to the chest and just commit so heavily that you know, no matter what, even if someone does say no, you're going to find a way. And as a result, you had this transformational experience. You accomplished all of the things that you set out to. And now your perspective on the world was totally different, which leads perfectly into, and you just alluded to it, your commitment to serving and your mission work and what you do now in Nicaragua, Costa Rica. So can you share with the listeners about this? Because I loved how this transformational experience that you went through led to some of your greatest contributions to some people who need it the most. Yeah, that's great. And, and one of the things I'd like to share is Zig Ziglar says, share your give up goals with many. So if you want to give up smoking or give up something, it'll, people will hold you accountable. I'm giving up smoking. Uh -huh. uh, your go up goals with very few. Ooh, I because, like that. Because if you want to be quarterback of the football team, guess what? So does 17 other people. If you want to be CEO of this company, so does 17 other, you know, 500 other people. If you want to be this, so your go up goals and people will sabotage you. And then sometimes it's not on purpose. Sometimes it is. Uh, you know, sometimes people, they love you and they don't want you to change because they're afraid they won't know you anymore. Hmm. Right. Or they'll lose your love. So the go up goals share with very, very few. The give up goals share with everyone. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah. So, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to go down to Costa Rica, get involved with a, a church down there. And we did something called the hands and feet ministry, which I, I love. And we built homes and fed families in a, in a really a refugee camp, an impoverished neighborhood in Nicaragua. We'd also go to a, a garbage dump there called La Chereca instead of a feeding station for the kids. And it was just really great. And, uh, you know, spent, I've uh, been doing that for maybe eight years now. And so I started doing it with the church. And then what I realized was, wow, you know, uh, there's something often gets in the way of people participating in events when it's related to a church or a specific religion. So what I did was I, I, I saw an opportunity to invite executives, entrepreneurs, and students to come down and, and have an impact uh, in a community like that without being it tied to a religion. Because even for me, religion was in the way of participating because there weren't a lot of Catholic groups that were going down. It was sort of these these uh, non-denominational groups that would go. So I never felt like I could go. So now I started something called Surf and Serve. And your listeners can go to surfandserve.com and check out what it is we do. There's lots of cool pictures up there and some stuff is heart-wrenching. And uh, so we go down now and we build homes and feed families in this really impoverished neighborhood called Tipi Tapa outside of, in, outside of Managua, Nicaragua. And these are people who've been displaced. Either they were living in the garbage dump and they've been displaced or their homes were flooded out. And so they really have nothing. And what happens is a lot of folks come from the United States where everything is safe and it's cushy and it's available. I mean, being in the United States is a ticket to abundance comparably to 
pretty much any other country, especially third world country out there. And so one of the things that happens is you get to see how people live and how desperate their condition may be, yet they're still happy. Right. Really happy. And that changes your perspective on life as well as uh, giving. You know, I think uh, the fastest way to gratitude is helping others. You know, if you're upset about something or you're bent out of shape or you're, you're depressed, you know what, go serve someone. You know, one of the things uh, you don't know about me, I don't think, is that, you know, I spent about six or seven years coaching the Special Olympics, both basketball and soccer in Arlington, Virginia. Hmm. You know, that's some of the greatest times of my life, spending those two hours every Tuesday and Thursday night and then the weekends for games, you know, Tuesday nights, Tuesdays and Thursday night practices. And so there's a sacrifice there. I gave up my valuable time, but I get so much more out of it. You know, on the other side of serving is just this incredible gift that money can't buy. Uh, and so same thing in Nicaragua is we put these trips together and you end up having relationships with people when you're serving side by side and you're building a home. When I say home, you go to surfandserve.com, you'll see the kind of homes I'm talking about. They're cinder block and tin roof shacks, really, with no electricity or water. So it's just shelter from the sun, the rain and the wind. But they're so grateful. I mean, so grateful. We put these things up in about two days. And then we distribute about 250 uh, bags of food to families that last them between two weeks and a month, uh, just essentials for them. And it's been a real great part of my life. It's a, uh, it's a for benefit company, not a nonprofit. Uh, and so we lead these trips down there and people have massive breakthroughs. And oftentimes some of the executives and entrepreneurs will bring uh, their children and uh, they'll get a breakthrough too. I can imagine, especially for these executives, there's people who've lived their life in the States. They've always been in the corporate world. They're in, like you said, almost in the ivory tower. They're going to the fancy parties. They're wearing tuxedos and everything's so easy. And we often have this, this feeling and this urge, like this yearning for something else because we're like, exactly the moment you had, is this all there is? Yes. There's got to be more to this life than just indulging and, you know, crushing it in sales. There's got to be more. And when these people get to see it, now all of a sudden, what's really interesting, I interviewed a guy just a couple of weeks ago who was in Africa with his family and they had an opportunity to meet a family that was, and actually, Kevin, as promised, Donna, my lovely train guest, is coming by. So this, as uh, for any listeners who are new to the show, Donna is the train and comes by every time I'm doing an episode. And Donna likes to help me promote my guests. So Kevin, I know you've got several businesses and several sites, but where can listeners come to learn more about Kevin Donahue? Yeah, great. Thank you. You go to executivesalessource.com. That's one word, executivesalessource.com. That's my consulting business. You can get an idea of what it is I do with companies, how I help them to uh, increase prices. And then surfandserve.com, which I mentioned, is a, is a really cool place to go check out uh, what I'm up to. And there's one other that's we're sort of on the cusp of something really profound in the neuro performance world. And my website is neuroperformanceacademy.com, neuroperformanceacademy.com, or just Google Neuro Performance Academy and you'll find it. Uh, I think you'll be fascinated about what uh, we're doing in the world of neurology and functionalology there uh, and uh, to increase uh, sports performance and, uh, and health and, uh, and, and memory. It's really fascinating. Fantastic. Thank you, Donna. So back in, so a guy who was traveling with his family in Africa, they met a family that was hosting them and developed this amazing connection and then found out that their child needed this open heart surgery that if they saved their entire life, they could never afford. Mm -hmm. uh, oh my God, well, how much is it? Like, and they were like, maybe we can help. Maybe we can give you the first down payment, 200 US dollars. And they, their jaws dropped. They immediately gave them the money and now it's something like eight, 10 years later, that young girl is grown up, she's healthy. And it's like we heard Joe Paula say at the event, anyone who says money can't buy happiness hasn't given enough of it away. And that concept of things to us that are trivial, you know, $200 for most people that are probably listening to this podcast, probably got an iPhone, you've got a car, you've got all these things. $200 is a couple nights out at a restaurant or out at the bar. And that can drastically change somebody's life. And before we move on to some of your other businesses, I'd just like you to quickly touch on language because you and I have a passion for language. We're the, the big pasty white guys who nobody expects to speak a language and we're both fluent. And 
you and I both know the incredible feeling it is to hear someone share their story in their native language versus their second or third language. So can you share with the listeners why it was so important for you to learn a language and how you went about doing it? Yeah, I, I think the best way to learn anything is immersion for me. You know, in, in school or books, it's really not my way. I have to be on the court doing it. And, uh, and for me, language is just so powerful. It gives you access to a world you otherwise can't enter into, a culture that you can't participate in. And so I, and I thought, found it fascinating that people come here without knowing any English. They never take official courses. In fact, there was a guy from El Salvador who was on my Special Olympics team, and the guy spoke Spanish and English. I mean, he, you know, and, uh, and I said, how did you learn? He was in, in, in El Calle, you know, in the streets. And I said, you just, you're telling me you just sat there and listened to people. He goes, yeah. And he spoke flawless English. I said, my goodness, that's amazing. And so for me, uh, going to Costa Rica and putting myself in an environment where that was the language, I, I had to do that. And so the first thing I did when I got to Costa Rica, knowing my goals, knowing my vision, my five, I got involved with a, a Spanish school. And I spent out about a month and a half there uh, and then uh, you know, got involved in the local church. And I'd go to church in Spanish. And so then I learned two things. I learned uh, la, la, la palabra de Dios y español, dos cosas, right? I learned two things, the word of God and uh, Spanish. And mm -hmm. so I could sit there not really being able to follow, but then I learned. I'd go to Spanish-speaking Bible studies. And so I was killing two birds with one stone there. <laughs> I remember during rainy season, I moved to uh, San Jose and I just immersed myself. I had one instructor there, one-on-one -on -one tutor. And then I'd go to lunch with this Russian gal named Masha. And she <laughs> had moved from Russia to Costa Rica 14 years prior. And she spoke two languages, Russian and Spanish. She spoke no English. So I'd take her to lunch and we'd just sit there and talk. Mm -hmm. I'd have to quickly learn because she didn't speak any English. And, uh, and it was really powerful. So that's, that's how I learned. I think that's, for me, the best way to learn. I think there's some other, other things out there. You can, do, uh, you can do the Rosetta Stone and learn some stuff. But for me, it's the full immersion. It's not only being around the culture and listening and being part of it and picking up the idiosyncrasies, but also I'm telling myself I'm fully committed. Right. Buying a Rosetta Stone, you're kind of committed. Moving to Costa Rica, okay, gotcha. Like mm -hmm. I'm putting myself on notice. I'm putting my brain and my life on notice. You better learn this because we ain't leaving here until you do. Right. right. It's that higher level and stepping up into something to say, I'm so committed that I will do blank. And yeah. for all the listeners, you, I know, I guarantee some of you out there are like, oh, well, I don't have the money to get immersed right now or that's just not in the cards. You can even immerse yourself with the internet. I taught myself Portuguese living in Wisconsin and there was no level of immersion from a Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese standpoint, but using the internet, you can immerse yourself at times during the day. You can connect with people all over the world. And that's why I put together the product that I made to help people learn languages because so many people want it and they don't think it's possible, but you found what worked best for you. And that's what I encourage people to do. It's like find what works best and then lean in, commit, dedicate the time because your life will change. Yeah. Now, Kevin, this is blown by. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure we hit on a few other key points. So I definitely want you to have a chance to share about the work that you're doing in enhancing the, the, the investigation into neuro capacity and how you're enhancing athletes, because this was, this was some of the most next level stuff I've ever had a conversation about. So can you give a few minutes on what you're working on and how you expect this will change the future of not just athletics, but people's health. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. It's, uh, what's, it's also a tragedy to triumph story as well, because I was in Ecuador uh, four years ago now, and I had a motorcycle accident, so I ended up with a concussion. Didn't know it at the time, but then after being home for several weeks, I realized, oh my gosh, I had a concussion. And I had to, I had to resolve my own problems, because it's really, really tough when you have a concussion. And so I started something called the Concussion Recovery Network. I wrote a book called Concussion Transformation. And then I got to know some of the top functional neurologists on the planet. So Dr. Ted Carrick, Dr. Matt Antonucci, Freddie Garcia, and a whole staff of these guys. And I got to observe Carrick. Now, so your listeners know who Dr. Ted Carrick is. He's the guy who got Sid Crosby back in the game of hockey. Sidney wow. Crosby, one of the top hockey players in the world, knocked out with several concussions. Doctors said he'd never play again. Carrick had him back in the ice in a few weeks. Wow. I mean, 
it, it, it's almost on the on the verge of miraculous, uh, but but it's not because these guys it's just what they do. And so what I was looking at after I recovered and watched getting to observe Carrick and some of these guys, what they do, I was watching them fix really broken people. And their hallways are lined with Olympic athletes, NHL hockey players, UFC fighters. And I said, let me ask you something. If we were to take this, and what if we worked with someone who has a brain that's not terribly injured, that they're fine, what could happen? And they said, well, I mean, who knows? Could be limitless breakthroughs. And so what we're talking about here is uh, neuroplasticity. And just so you get a quick overview and understanding is your brain is like a GPS map for your nervous system. So from your head to your toe and throughout your entire body, there's about a trillion neurological connections that make everything work. You can move your fingers because your brain knows where your fingers are. You can move your toes because your brain knows where your toes are. Uh, but what happens is your brain can't keep track of all trillion uh, neural connections. So they atrophy. Just like if you don't work out your biceps, they start to go away. You know, if you don't run for a while, your brain forgets how to, you know, have the capacity to be able to run long distance. And so the, the neural map does the best it can to keep track of everything. But imagine having a GPS map on your phone missing 95% of the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, how efficiently and how could you really perform driving from point A to point B in your city or a city you've never been to before? And the answer is probably not. You're going to take a long cut. Right. So all, what we do is we put people through our program, and I was the first person to go through the neural performance program, and we rewire the brain for high performance. So we light up those super highways so you can go full speed. And what happens is it unleashes your strength, your, uh, your memory, your uh, overall health, your, uh, like your, it cured me fatigue, um, your flexibility, your endurance. So your brain puts a capacity on what it can do because your brain is built for one thing and one thing only, and that's to survive. Mm -hmm. You said earlier about those voices in your head that'll stop you. You know, that's your brain saying, hey, don't, don't move because if you move, you might ruin everything. You might lose all your money. You <laughs> might, your friends might not. So it's a little bit different than that because it's from a functional perspective. That's more of a psychological perspective, but it's the same theory. Like, why am I held back? Well, our brain holds us back on purpose because it's afraid of what the future might hold because it's new, right? So all we do is we give the brain, we use leverage neuroplasticity to give the brain more information, usually through the visual system, your eyes, the vestibular system, your inner ear balance, and your proprioceptive system, which is your joints, your muscles, and everything else. We look at how someone's brain's collecting information. We rewire it to collect it better or give it information it's never had before so it can perform better. You know, so for me, after putting myself to the program, what's really interesting was six months later, I gained about 17 pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. I'm 43 years old. I have no reason to be gaining that kind of muscle. My diet didn't change much, but my brain allowed my body to gain muscle mass. Fascinating. Uh, I also, my memory went through the roof and I was suffering from fatigue and then no longer. Wow. And they discovered all kinds of interesting things like how my eyes were moving how I was walking and they do all these different things and they put you through this program. And if your li listeners want to see a cool video, you can go to neuroperformanceacademy.com or look that up on YouTube and you'll see some cool videos of me going through the program. So it's early adapter stuff right now, Brian, you know, right now when a pro athlete signs a contract, he's got a, phys he gets a physician, a physical therapist, a nutritionist, a strength coach, a massage therapist. Nobody right now is looking at the brain or very <laughs> few people are. You know, but if, but the brain is the final frontier, it's where all performance comes from, whether it's thinking or actual uh, physical performance. So that's what we're looking at right now. We're in early stages. We've got a small group going down of, of entrepreneurs uh, in November to go through the program. And uh, yeah, we're building basically a case study right now. Uh, and meanwhile, these guys are using their talents to help heal people who are broken. Mm -hmm. That. It's such an exciting concept and topic. It sounds like science fiction movie. It sounds like limitless. It sounds like that magic pill, but it's just rewiring the existing structure to help you get to the next level. And it's also, I remember you telling me the example of these guys in these elite sports, you got men and women in elite sports. They're so close physically that it's these small little microseconds that you make got a it. difference. Nanoseconds and millimeters. That's absolutely right. Especially in a game like baseball or look at the Olympics. You know, these guys, it's a, it's a tenth of a second or whatever it may be. You're absolutely right. And this, the brain is the final frontier in being able to, it's almost like defragging your computer 
or deleting the cookies or whatever to give your, your computer the ability to operate better. But the more accurate analogy is like giving your GPS system correct street maps. You know, if you're missing streets or it doesn't know the roads out, you can drive yourself right off a bridge. Mm-hmm. And it's just doing the best it can with, with the resources it's got. So you're absolutely right. That's fascinating stuff. And so can we do uh, five additional minutes from our original time? Do you have a, sure a hard, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I want to ask one more question here, a uh, question about your business. And then we have our two closing questions. Because this, I, I remember just getting that giddy excitement, like, oh my God, like it's, it just fascinated me that people are digging into this. So can you tell the listeners a bit about how you actually are doing this? Like, how are you reprogramming and rewiring the brain? You gave me a little bit of an explanation when we met and I think it's just, it seemed almost, I was like, it's that just that one thing, they're stimulating that one nerve and yet all of this massive change. So could you share with them a bit about how this process looks like without, now obviously if there's proprietary stuff, we're not trying to dive in there. <laughs> no, not, nothing's propri- proprietary. It's, it's really as simple as this. It's, it's the data that your brain is getting. Uh, and is it proper data? Is it accurate data? So one of the, the biggest ways your brain collects data or information is through your visual system, your eyeballs. It's the number one mechanism that tells your brain, is there a threat? Will I live? You know? <laughs> and so all day long, your brain is saying, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And your eyes are telling the story. Yeah, I'm safe. I'm cool. And you, know, you can sit there where you're at and you're placed there in a nice posture and calm because no one's coming at you, attacking you. No fan is falling from the ceiling. You know? <laughs> Nothing's coming at you. So your brain says, yeah, I'm in a safe space. So what happens is over time is your eyes you have ocular muscles. So there's muscles, six ocular muscles in each eye. And so what happens is over time, those muscles atrophy because you're not using them or they haven't been exercised appropriately. And your brain is also an efficiency machine. It wants the shortcuts. You know, it wants the easiest way because it doesn't want to burn energy. The best way I can explain that is your nose sits in front of your eyeballs all day long and you never see it. Hmm. Your brain has determined it's not important. It's not a threat. Don't pay attention to it. <laughs> So what happens is like if you don't work out your biceps, your brain says, if you had a cast on your arm, even a better example, what happens to your arm when the cast comes off? It's like disappeared. It's half the size it was. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you haven't used it. And your brain says, don't you waste energy on stuff you're not using. So back to your ocular muscles. Since you haven't used them, your brain says they're not important. I'll just turn my head and look. So what happens is you start to have tunnel vision. You know, you see old people kind of, you know, slumped over. A lot of that is because of vision, poor vision. So one of the things we do is we look at how your eyes are collecting data. You know, is it accurate data? Are your eyes moving appropriately to a target when the target shows up? Or is it delayed? And what's that delay causing? So it's really specific to the individual that comes into the lab. So we have a lab down in Orlando, Florida, and we have all kinds of sophisticated equipment, lasers, and you put these these goggles on your eyes that that tell you, you know, how your eyes are moving, when they're moving, are they moving appropriately according to stimulus? There's a laser that shoots out of, you know, that shoots in the wall and your eyes are supposed to react to the laser. It, it times how quickly your eyes react to the stimulus, the laser, and how accurately it lands on the stimulus. Hmm. This is important. Imagine being a baseball player and your vision's off just slightly, maybe right. because you had a, a slight brain injury, maybe because of neural atrophy. It, it all depends. And so then you combine that with your vestibular system, which is your inner ear or balance, which keeps you, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. When you have motion sickness, whether it's on a plane or a boat, uh, it's because your visual system is sending different signals than your vestibular system is sending. Hmm. So it makes you physically sick. Right. Right. So imagine now if your vestibular system is giving your brain a little bit of data that's not correct and your visual system is giving your data that's not correct, would you be able to do push-ups accurately? Well, the answer is, well, maybe, but you could do more if you had better data. Just right. simple as push-ups. Now we're, you know, we get into complex motions like swinging a baseball bat and hitting a baseball, it becomes a whole different ball game. And so you line up that with your, percep- your proprioceptive system. I always show an example, uh, you know, most people can't move from their wrist because they don't have access to their wrist because they've never had to move from their wrist before. And I can quickly give them access to their wrist. And so, you know, at the lab, we have, we do an assessment and we go through, we look at vitals. And then we, we go through what are the goals and, you know, what's the outcome. And then we start to rewire the brain based on the outcome. One of the things for me is my memory went through the roof. Uh, and it's these simple little exercises that create a profound difference. It's why Sidney Cro- Sid Crosby was able to get back on the ice. Because Carrick was able to look at his brain injury from a different perspective. He was looking at it from, okay, 
what's not working and what is working, how could we leverage what is working to help what's not working work better? Wow. It's kind of like what, why, what fires together wires together. Mm-hmm. So if, if one thing is having a deficiency, we can operate, activate something else in the brain and then uh, make that thing work better. And it's either an improved quality of life, improved performance, or sometimes it's total healing altogether. Wow. It really, it sounds like science fiction. I mean, when you were saying lasers on the wall, I was just waiting for you to be like, and then we pull out a lightsaber because we have lightsabers now and we use that for visual tracking. It's Well, we are looking at, you know, one of the things that the docs are looking at, and, and let me explain something too. I'm not the expert, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I work with the experts. What I do is I communicate in a way that's compelling, as I mentioned before, that, that shows up as an opportunity, as a future opportunity or possibility for the people I'm speaking to so that they want to do it too. Right. You know, and so the docs are the experts. And one of the things we're looking at now is virtual reality. Uh, we're going to start doing pre IQ tests. And so that way, the, uh, you know, we, how does this impact your IQ? Can it impact your intelligence? Well, who knows? Right. And, and the thing too, Brian, is that all this is breakthrough in the last 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. I mean, before we didn't have access to the nervous system or the brain that we do now. We have ways of measuring and looking at things that uh, are really powerful. So, uh, we'll see a lot more breakthroughs. And this is early stage stuff uh, coming over the next five to 10 years as technology gets better and as our uh, our knowledge of the brain gets better. I'm just excited to see you on the cover of the magazine talking about, well, we've mastered human flight and now yeah, we can right? hold our breath for four hours. It's, it feels like the possibilities are limitless. So, all right, before I get off on that, because it is such a, it's such a fascinating topic, I also love... But one of the things I love about the show is hearing passionate people talk about what they're passionate about. And I remember seeing you light up when you were talking about Spanish in person and both on the interview, talking about working with the Special Olympics, talking about this. It's, it's just, it gets me excited about things that I'm working on in my life, the things you're doing. So now, unfortunately, we do need to wrap up though, because I want to make sure I'm not trying to monopolize your entire evening. So... Um, One question before we hit our two wrap-up questions, and this is really a personal one for me because I had a moment of, you know, Brian, you're doing a lot of things right now, and it feels like a lot of things are moving forward just a little bit, and it's like I'm juggling a lot of things, and I said to a friend, it almost feels like I'm just trying to keep it from all falling apart. It doesn't feel like it's a well-oiled machine that's just trucking along. You're running multiple businesses. You're traveling all over the world. You're speaking. You're working in high-level neuroscience. You're doing surf and serve. You're doing executive sales force. So in terms of balance and how do you keep all of your priorities straight, what are some of your best recommendations on how you arrange and organize your days and how you plan so that you not only succeed, but you really live life. You're not just going meeting to meeting and then crash in bed at night and then repeat. Because earlier in your story, you said there was this feeling of just, all right, we're just doing it. What's the point? Now you have a lot of purpose and you're driven towards helping people in a much deeper way. But I can imagine with everything you've got going on, it's got to be overwhelming at times. So how do you balance that? Well, I don't believe in balance. You okay. know, I think balance is sort of a, is a, is a myth, you know? You, so here's how I, how I deal with it, right? Like I've partnered with the top experts in the world in the world of functionalology. I don't have to be the expert in the world. I don't have to manage the center. I don't have to be the guy who knows everything about the brain. I just got to do what I'm the best in the world at. So it's like, if you go, if you remember the cartoon, you're a little bit young, but the, you know, the hall of justice or you are the X-Men, right? Yep. Each one has a very specific uh, superpower. They're not all trying to do everything. So I think the key is knowing what you're the best in the world at, or you're really, really good at, you're trying to be the best in the world at, and then partnering with people who are the best in the world at what they do. Mm. You know, it's like, you know, I've partnered in the past with Joe Polish. I helped him grow his genius network. He's the best in the world at, at what he does. So I, all I had to do is be the best in what I do. And that's, telling a story that creates a future that's of new possibilities for people and then inviting them to participate with me. Right. Right. And so same thing with the neuro stuff. Like all I have to do is go out there and tell this powerful story and my life becomes an invitation. Same thing with surf and serve. You know, I have a, you know, a COO that runs everything. All I have to do is go out there and be passionate about it and invite people. So that's one of the ways I do it is I partner with people who are the best in the world at what they do. And then you got to follow the, you follow the money. Right, like one of my philosophies that I teach in executive sales source is, you know, the three principles of business. There's three, and one is get the money, 
<laughs> number two is get the money. And number three is get the money. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's the purpose of business is to be profitable. Right. So there's certain things you have to do and you have to test and some things don't work. That spa and tanning salon I had, I lost my behind on that thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really did, you know, I went bankrupt because of that. And so like I had to test it and that market didn't work for me and I wasn't the best in the world at that. So that a lot of it, what I was saying earlier about your twenties, it's a really good opportunity to test, you know, go after what you're passionate about, but really get good at it. There's a great book, book out there called, uh, so good. They can't ignore you. Mm -hmm. And it kind of dispels the idea of following your passion myth, you know, be so damn good. that can't ignore you. I'm the best in the world, Brian, at selling at high levels. They ain't no one better than me. I mean, there's people as good, but I'm the best in the world at it. So I find other opportunities out there that, uh, that fit into my world that I'm passionate about. And I partner with those people. I don't, big, I don't build big staffs. I just uh, I partner with people who have the infrastructure and I, I go from there. And so really it's about managing what you want to do, uh, but it takes some time to get there, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to be able to really look at your, your profit model. Like, okay, is it profitable what I'm doing? If it's not, either raise your prices or stop doing it, right? right. And that, that comes to business, right? Now, with, uh, with Surf and Serve, I, you know, it's a kind of a, it, it's a for benefit model, which means our profits go back to the cause that we're working for. But it's, uh, you know, it's, if I break even with that, I'm stoked, right? Mm -hmm. I've lost money on that in the past, but I don't care. I'm making a difference and it's my philanthropy. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, how do I manage my day as I pick and choose? I have an assistant. And my assistant manages a lot of the, well, we got on this call because my assistant set it up. Right. And only time I mess things up is when I take control of my calendar. <laughs> I let she handles it and I don't mess with stuff. And she, and when I do, I mess things up. <laughs> and, and the fact is sometimes I am exhausted. Like sometimes I'm like wiped out, but it's usually for stuff that I'm really in love with. And I think we have to kind of look at that meter. You know, it was really hard to go to Costa Rica. It was really hard to give up my career. It was really hard to give up my clients and give up all the stuff and my friends and everything to go to Costa Rica. But it was my bigger future. And it was my purpose and my passion. I knew there was a bigger future for me than I was living. So it's also that. It's like, what is it that's, uh, you know, I, I have this model where I draw a stick figure. A, I draw a hill. And at the top of the hill, I draw a stick figure with a smiley face. At the bottom of the hill, I draw a stick figure you know, no smiley face yet. And then I do a little bubble out, out of the guy's mouth that says, Hey, come on up. It's fun up here. Mm -hmm. And then the guy at the bottom of the hill is like, I'm on my way. <clears throat> so the, the guy at the top of the hill is my future me. And then what I try to do, I draw boulders that are falling down. These are the obstacles I might face on my way to the top of the hill. And I try mm -hmm. to define what are my obstacles going to be? You know, is it going to be cash? Is it going to be a competition? What is it going to be? So then that future me, can, I can start to plan out what are the things I need to do in order to get where I want to go. And as long as I keep my eye on the prize, and this is for me, what did it take for me to get to Costa Rica? A map of Costa Rica on my bathroom mirror that, that I saw every day. That's what it took. Everything else works itself out. Hmm. If I would have been concerned about balance, I probably would have never made it to Costa Rica. I was letting my destiny pull me forward. <clears throat> One other thing, that I'll share with you that's been very helpful for me is I'm very clear on the quality of life I want to live. Mm -hmm. So I did this program called Lifebook years ago, and it takes 12 categories of life and it maps out those 12 categories of life. So my health and fitness, my emotional life, my intellectual life, my character life, my spiritual life, my social life, my career life, my financing life, my relationship life, all of these things I have mapped out. So I'm really clear. I mean, if you get in the car today, you say, I'm driving to uh, New York City. Is anything going to get in between you and getting to New York City? No. no. It might take you a few hours. Or there's tra there might be some obstacles like traffic or tolls, or, but you'll figure it out. If right. you know your goal is to get to, coast to, to New York City, you're going to get there. We do this all the time. I have a flight tomorrow to Santa Cruz or San Jose, California. I'm going to get there, I promise you. I'll be at the airport an hour early. I'll, I'll make that flight. Why? Because I'm really clear on that goal. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to worry about balancing anything. I just have to worry about what my destiny is. Hmm. So I have short-term and long-term destiny goals or visions for my life. And I let those manage and balance my life. That's fantastic. I love, I love the concept of getting so clear on what are you world-class at? What are you best in the world at? What are the things you want to do and the things that you don't? 
do whatever you can to essentially outsource those other functions. Like you said, either your scheduling or having the infrastructure or be the other experts, you let them do what they're best at so that you can be totally focused on doing what you're best at. And then your vision is so clear of where you want to end up that it doesn't really matter what comes up. Yeah, it's going to be hard at times. Yeah, it's going to be confusing. Yeah, there's going to be challenges, but it's like, but I'm still going to find a way. So that clarity pulls you through and that's fantastic. Yeah, life is never balanced. It's, it's sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're sad, sometimes we're angry, sometimes we're loving. It's just, you know, it's life, right? It's like I heard a while back at a course I took was, uh, you, know, you know, the heartbeat monitor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, you know, jaggedy up and down, up and down. Yep. You know, like if, if it was a straight line across, what would that tell you? Dead. Yeah, you're dead, right? So those peaks and valleys, that's life. You know, sometimes there's ups and downs. I mean, you know, that, that means you got a heartbeat. It means you're alive. It means you're still mm -hmm. in the game. So you, as soon as it's like even and balanced, hey, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, because I mean, really, it comes down to, and it sounds cliche, but I often say it's just because a cliche doesn't mean it's untrue. It just means we've heard it so much. But the idea that if we didn't have the downs, we wouldn't appreciate the ups. It's really true, especially so true. if you go through a really tumultuous time in your life and you come out of that, the perspective is so different. When you go to a place that people don't even have running water, they don't have electricity, that may not be your down, but that can be their down. And you're like, oh my God, it totally shifts the perspective. So yeah. Kevin, I appreciate the extra time. And now I want to hit the closing questions and wrap things up. So uh, same closing questions on every episode of Overcoming Graduation. And the first one is this. Young adults often, and we've touched on this a bit, talking about how your 20s and even your early 30s is a great time to experiment, try, learn, and get really good at the things that you love and that you see you can bring massive value in. But what I'd love for you to touch on now is young adults often think that they're too inexperienced to bring value, that they need certifications, they need certain education, that one day they'll be able to bring value to the world, but today isn't that day. Mm -hmm. And they get trapped by that idea. So what is the value that you think young adults bring to the world specifically today? Yeah, you know, go out there and ask people what, what they need help with. You know, here's what I would say is find people who are a few steps ahead of you and offer to help them. You know, like sometimes it's going to lunch. One of my mentors was a guy who was the CEO of a multi-billion dollar government contracting agency. I'd meet him for coffee. Here's what you'd be surprised at. People really want to help you. And people are really interested in what you're doing. You know, so if you go, if you, if you express interest in people, they'll be interested in you and they'll help you. And then how can you add value to someone's life? You know, I had a guy who was an intern for me. I, I, I've lectured at Radford University at the College of Business and Economics. To go back to the college thing, you know, I have a degree in criminal justice. A year and a half ago, I was lecturing at the College of Business and Economics. And I had a student come up to me. He's like, hey, Kevin, how can I help you? And he was the one of, of you know, I don't know, a hundred students that I spoke with. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I said, well, that's an interesting question. I said, uh, give me your email address or your phone number and I'll, I'll email you. And I said, I'll think of something. And then uh, I emailed him and I said, hey, I got this thing called Concussion Recovery Network. Would you like to intern for me and help me out with that? He was like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He ended up meeting all kinds of amazing people. You know, seeing all, I mean, he's met more people than anyone I know. He's 20 years old, 21 years, no, he's 20 years old. And he just offered to help me. And so then I, I've taken an interest in him and I've helped him and I flew him out to Arizona. I took him skydiving first <laughs> time. You know, it's like, so people will take an interest in you when you show that you'll take an interest in them. And sometimes what I'd recommend too is getting a job for the education, not the paycheck. Be sure you get paid, you know, if it's, if it's a job where that's the, that's the agreement, but also look for the education, the value of building your network and building your uh, your your knowledge and wisdom as well as your character and uh and if, if you go from there you're, you're gonna win right when there's a focus on how you're growing and people often get caught up in how how's my educational credentials growing but to your point how are my relationships how am i investing in my relationship capital how am i developing as a human being how am i improving communicating and when you come into every experience looking to grow and looking to serve and help others that just creates this virtuous cycle where you attract other people like that who want to be around people who are doing great things in the world. So fantastic. Correct. And our final question is this, and I'm going to 
tweak it a little bit because typically what I'll ask listeners is if they could go back to talk to their younger selves at graduation, what advice would they give their younger self? But I'd like to tweak it a little bit to go back to that time where you were standing in that penthouse and you were like, is this really all there is? Because the steps you took have led you exactly where you wanted to be. So I, I'm not sure the advice you would give, but I'd be really curious to hear what advice would you give to your younger self if you could go back to that moment knowing everything you know now? You know, it's simple. Keep going. It's better than you think. <laughs> you know, have faith. You know, really like walk with faith. You know, there's plenty of examples in the Bible, plenty of examples about the history of the United States of America. I mean, we have to take these steps of faith. You know, it's like, it's like miracles show up when we take great risks. I say God grants miracles to those who take great risks. If you're just playing an average simple game, don't expect miracles. You got to play big. You have to have a big vision. And I always say my vision, God's plan. Like hmm. when you operate from that place, like here's what's happened. Like, for example, uh, you know, Richard Branson is the CEO of Virgin Airlines, has the, Ver, uh, you know, Necker Island. He's a famous entrepreneur uh, and really an icon, especially of my generation. Uh, he's just a, an awesome guy. Uh, I cut out a picture of Richard Branson and I put it in my journal and I said, oh, this guy's an interesting guy. I'd like to meet him or work with him one day. You know, two years later, I get a call from my friend. He says, hey, man, I'm having uh, dinner with Richard Branson tomorrow night in Beverly Hills. Would you like to go? <laughs> and then six months after that, I'm on his island for six days, hanging out on his boat with him. Is, you know, he's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, my gosh, like, I would have it no other way. It's our responsibility to have a vision. It's like planting a seed. When you plant a seed, you have a vision. I want to grow tomatoes. But you have no idea. It's really none of your business how beautiful and delicious and how amazing those tomatoes come up. But what I promise you is if you nurture them, especially with service to others, they'll come up better and bigger and more delicious than you can possibly think. What I say is the, the DNA, the, the blueprint for that fruit to show up is inside that seed. That's God's business, not mine. It's my business to plant the seed in fertile soil to nurture it. So I have to have a vision first, plant the seed, wait patiently or have faith and wait for the outcome to come. So it's, it's, about, it's not about resigning to God or whoever your creator is. It's about have, taking personal responsibility for who I want to be as a man and then planting the seeds in order to get there and then letting it unfold how it unfolds. And so that's what I would say to myself around that time say, hey man, you're planting the right seeds. Just keep going. Don't give up. Keep nurturing the soil. Keep watering the plants. It's going to come. Don't just have faith. And you know, so a carrot takes 46 days to grow if you plant a seed. You know, a coconut may take seven years if you plant it. You know, a baby in a, in a woman's uh, belly takes about nine months. There's a, there's a gestation period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't get anxious and, and, and weird and say, oh, I'm so frustrated. You can get frustrated, but it doesn't help anything. You just got to know that God's plans in the work. So, you know, just keep going and have faith. That's what I would say. And I love that you have the emphasis on do everything that you can do and then have patience. You know, yeah. it's take the steps that you know you can. I love in Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is, she says there's your business, their business, and God's business. And when you're in their business or God's business, you're wasting your time. That's where your stress and your anxiety comes. So your idea of plant the seed, nurture it, do everything you can for it, help and serve it, and then allow it to grow in the time that it's meant to. That's a lesson I needed to hear right now, especially young, growing up with technology, growing up with the internet, we get this sense of immediacy and everything and that we can get the answers right away. And we should be able to get Jimmy John's in two minutes. And we should be able to have these things immediately. And it really is messing with people in a way where we're losing, or it's very possible that people can lose that sense of patience to do the real work and commit to those long-term relationships, like you said earlier when talking about selling, it's committing to all of the long-term relationships in your life to work and help them grow and nurture them, and especially that relationship with yourself. Because, well, and, and Brian, I'll give you an example. I yeah. went to a, a U2 concert last night. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I've always liked U2 as a band, you know, but the, I had the opportunity to go to the concert. So there I was, like, you know, 30 or 10 rows back from the stage, and I'm watching Bono sing. And this is a band that got together in 1976. 
Wow. <laughs> I did not 40, know. 40. I didn't know either. I looked it up last. I'm like, yeah, we're <laughs> together forever. 1976, I think one of them was 14 years old, and they put a posting at their school, hey, I'd like to put a band together. Wow. And these guys had no idea that they would be international influencers. They, they would be one of the top rock bands of all time. That They'd be playing for, for decades to come. But they just planted that seed, and they let kind of God's plan go to work in their lives, and they'll be the first to tell you. They were loyal. They were men of character. They do the right thing. They're still, all four are still together. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a 40-year plan that's un- still unfolding. Who knows? They, who knows where they'll go from here? So the idea of what you just said is really critical, especially now. Like, what is that 30, 40, 50-year plan? One of the greatest things a young person can do right now is extend their time horizon. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the Chinese are famous for their dynasties, like the Ming dynasty or whatever the dynasty is. The Chinese people think in terms of 100 and 500 years. I'm doing something now for 500 years from now. Mm-hmm. That's destiny thinking as opposed to consumer, me first, I got to get consume, I got to get this now thinking. It's really just changing the direction to look further out. I knew I wasn't going to learn Spanish right away. I knew that my, I didn't know how my life was going to fold, but I knew make, taking that big risk and going to Costa Rica at the time, giving up everything I knew was going to change my life forever. And here we are today talking about it. It becomes an extraordinary story to share. Right. It shifts from, oh, how can I pay off my loans and make $100,000 in two years, which is just all me. For, I mean, it, it, even just saying it feels heavy and it feels mm-hmm. like, wow, oh, I got it. Versus how can I build a business where I'm serving people in these countries I've visited? How can I connect with other cultures? And then if I took it literally in my head, as you said that, I went, what if I took all my goals right now and extended my time frame from five years to 30 years? Mm-hmm. Like, imagine what I could do in 30 years. I mean, <laughs> and also I'm burning myself the hell out right now. It's like, I'm doing mm-hmm. so many things trying to force it. I'm tr- I, basically what I'm doing right now is sitting there yelling at the seed in the ground. Like, come on. Let's That's right. On That's it. I'm That's screaming it. at dirt, which makes me crazy. I think I'm a little bit insane basically. So yeah. But, Kevin, man, this was fantastic. I want to thank you so much. You have dropped tons of knowledge. And there's so many things running through my head now and even more questions. I think we'll probably have to have you back sometimes because this was just wonderful. And I really want to thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's always a pleasure to share. You know, one of my goals is to be, is that not only uh, me personally, but my life is an influence uh, to younger people that, you know, they can, about what's possible. And, you know, to, and to all this, the wisdom I shared, you know, I just want my life to be a reflection of, of that possibility. So thank you so much for having me on the show and uh, here for you if you need anything. Thank you so much, man. And for all the listeners, all of the links to everything that Kevin referenced will be included in the show notes. So you'll be able to learn more. And I'm definitely going to be trying to figure out how I can increase my, well, I want to learn to fly. So I'm going to go check out your website and learn about how I can change my neuroplasticity. And uh, so Kevin, thank you so much, man. And actually one more time, would you be willing to share with the listeners the uh, three websites that you have that you'd like them to go check out? Sure, surfandserve.com, exactly like it sounds, uh, surfing and service. So surfandserve.com, that's our trip to Nicaragua. Neuroperformanceacademy.com uh, is our, uh, our neuroplasticity site. And the, uh, the other one is Executive Sales Source, and that's an S, Source, uh, Executive Sales Source. So you just kind of find out a little bit about how we help people to, uh, to exponentially grow their business through increasing their pricing. One of my favorite parts about that conversation with Kevin was that moment when he was standing in his penthouse apartment and he realized he was bored. Now, we all hit that point in our lives in one way or another. At some point, we realize that this isn't the life we want to live. We may have drifted off track. We may have just gotten caught up in some bad habits, or it may have been going on for a long time and it just something woke us up in that moment. Now, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll numb, we'll distract, we'll go drink, we'll hang out with unhealthy people, we'll create unhealthy relationships, or we'll just keep pretending it's what we want because we know other people want it. Other people will look up to us, and that insecurity drives us to stay in those unhealthy places. I know I've been there for sure in my own ways in life, but rather than do that or just keep living life and just say, well, I guess this is what it is, Kevin did a very powerful activity. 
And he said, if I had a magic wand, not if, what could I do realistically? Because I think we often hide behind the word realistic. He said, if I had a magic wand and there were no barriers, what would I do with my life? Because we're very interesting as human beings in that we will use our imagination, an incredibly powerful tool that we have against ourselves. We use our imagination to create all the reasons why we shouldn't, why we wouldn't, why we can't, why we won't. We create ridiculous excuses about why we can't do the things we want to or what might happen rather than creatively using our imagination for us, to empower us, to create exciting, beautiful futures. So in doing that, Kevin was able to take his life and isolate five things in it that he felt would enrich his life, would bring him up and allow him to give more. Because his whole life was built on that principle of bringing value to the world and bringing meaningful solutions. And if he brought meaningful solutions to himself, he'd better be able to do it for others. And then he did something that I've never heard of. I haven't heard of anyone else doing this. He said, what's one thing I could do to accomplish all of these? And then magically, something popped into his mind. Because you see, when we engage our imagination for us in empowering ways, it goes to work on those problems in a new way, in a different direction than we typically have the conversation going. I know there are times in my own mind where it's hard. It almost feels like my mind is so used to going to the negative that it's like, what do you mean you want a positive solution? Well, I, here's one. And I'm like, that sounds great. It's like, oh, well, here's another one. So it's only by removing the barriers that we're creating in our mind that we're able to see the possibility that exists on the other side. Because when we shoot down our own ideas instantly, immediately, in every situation, we don't give ourselves the chance for the excitement to take hold that leads to that first step and that first action. And then his resolve and his drive, even in the face of all these overwhelming obstacles, as I've heard many times, the quote, uh, those obstacles are there to show you how bad you want it. He just said, well, I can't fly, I'm going to drive. Well, I can't do this, or I can't drive, I'm going to fly. I can't do this, I'm going to do this. He found a way to make his dreams a reality, and as a result is inspiring so many other people and diving into these incredible worlds. And this isn't even talking about Neuro Performance Academy and all these other amazing things that he has gotten involved with and created, but it all came from taking care of himself first. Now, we talk a lot on this show about self-care, about personal development, but it's also about it's not just about your daily rituals and eating healthy and getting sleep. It's about giving yourself permission to be your own cheering section and be your biggest fan and be the one clapping for you. I saw Dean Graziosi put up a quote today saying, there's going to be times where no one's clapping for you and in those moments you need to be the one clapping for yourself. So we can all learn a ton from Kevin's story and from the way that he approached that challenge and how he chooses to live his life. Because getting to meet him in person, it was it was just a privilege because you can see the the vigor and the energy, the way he talks about things. He's not selling. He's not just trying to manipulate people to get a result. He is painting that brighter future. And if people want to come along or not, great, because he knows people are going to want to be on that train. I love that definition and that concept of selling because he's offering solutions people want and then helping them get connected with it. So in your own business, in your own life, Think about the areas that you could be helping connect people with things that would benefit them. And then how can you turn that into a business or how can you just do more of that in your life? Because connecting people with meaningful solutions is one of my favorite things. Connecting them with new ideas, perspectives, books, podcasts, you name it, any of those resources, people, ideas, concepts, any of it. That's one of my favorite things because that, I believe, is how we create a ripple in the world is by sharing things that lift other people up and then they can share it and so on and so on. So I want to thank Kevin so much for being on the show today. It was fantastic having him and an absolute pleasure to share this time with him. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of today's episode because you're the community that helps build this, helps share these messages, and helps get it out to more people. So if this episode was of value to you, please share it out with your friends and following. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Stitcher so you can get the most up-to-date episodes in the palm of your hand. Also, if you're interested in getting clear on what it is you want to do with your life, why that's so important to you, and learning how to make it happen faster than you ever thought possible, I want you to visit overcominggraduation.com slash coaching. 
There you can sign up for your free one hour clarity session with me where we can walk through what it is you want to do with your life, how to make it happen, and how to make it happen faster than you ever thought possible by getting clear on what's important to you and why. So again, that's overcominggraduation.com slash coaching and you can also find the link for that in the show notes. And finally, if you would like to reach out to me directly for interview recommendations, to provide feedback on the show, maybe share your number one biggest takeaway from this interview with Kevin, please email me at brian at overcominggraduation.com. And if you want to share out on social media, maybe on Instagram or Facebook, screenshot the episode on your podcast player, share it out and say what your biggest takeaway was. Tag me, tag Kevin. We'd love to see what were the most valuable nuggets you got from this episode because there were so many to choose from. So thank you all for listening today. I love you all. I love you for being a part of this. And I'll be talking to you again real soon.